I've been coming to the Philippines since 1998, when I was two years old. No, I'm just joking. Uh, and um, the Lord called me uh, to this country. I've, uh, I've been blessed to see an amazing work of God in this place. And I believe God is doing amazing things in this nation. He is restoring righteousness. He is restoring safety and peace in the streets of this uh, uh, country. And there are more things to come. Amen? I don't think you are that excited about it. Well, I say that again. Amen? Yeah. Oh, that one, much better. One of my favorite verses, if we talk about a month that is dedicated to prayer, one of my favorite verses is from James chapter 5. It's the latter part of verse 16, and it says, The effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. How many of you believe that the effective and fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much? How many of you believe that? Well, I'll tell you why. Because it has the word effective, which means we need to pray effectively. And it has the word fervent. We need to pray fervently. And it has the word righteous man. Our righteousness is Jesus. If you don't believe in Jesus, who, you know, the Bible says, he who knew no sin became sin, so we will become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So we can only become righteous if we believe in him who knew no sin and became sin. He took our sin and he gave us his righteousness. And so when we believe in him who knew no sin and we became righteous, then the effective and the fervent prayer of the righteous avails much. There is no way. God can hear your prayer if you are separated from Him because of your sin. The Bible says in the book of Isaiah that sin separated us from God. And through Jesus, our sins are no more there. And He has forgiven. He has taken them away from us. And therefore, our being righteous right now gives us the power to have effective and fervent prayer. Unfortunately, a lot of believers either don't pray or their prayers reflect their uh, spiritual walk, which is not that effective and certainly not fervent. I personally have just experienced two experiences over the last month and a half of what I call effective and fervent uh, prayer. And both of them showed me that we as believers have the power to change international events. And we can do things that even world leaders, other world leaders, and, and, and some billionaires around the world cannot do. And it all through the power of prayer. The ministry of Behold Israel over the last six months has uh, grown, grown so big that we have people following us from over 208 different countries, countries that I, I even never heard of them. I mean, in the smallest islands you can think of, people log on to beholdisrael.org and they watch my messages or they just take their phone and download the free app, Behold Israel, and they get news from Israel and they get my teachings. And I realized that it's so big, why don't I just go online and give every once in a while, sometimes every few days, what I call a prophecy update on Facebook Live, and then it goes to YouTube, and we have uh, so many thousands of people around the world that are watching it. And I thought to myself, if we have such power through the social media, why don't I use it when it comes to the effective and fervent prayer of the righteous. And if you remember, a month and a half ago, Donald Trump was actually uh, not the for sure candidate, the for sure person to win the elections in America. As far as the media concern, and I call them the media knights, the media already crowned Hillary Clinton as the next president of the United States. And I remember I was at church, it was Saturday, Shabbat in Israel, and we had a message on the good and the bad shepherds. And the Bible says in the book of Ezekiel chapter 34 that a good shepherd is the one that takes care of the sheep. That's why uh, Jesus said to Peter in John 21, he says, um, Peter, you know, if you love me, take care of my sheep, feed my sheep. It's all about the sheep, it's not about yourself. 
But then God in Ezekiel 34 accused the shepherds of Israel of that time for not taking care of the sheep and taking care of themselves. And this is exactly the last phase of the elections in America when all the, uh, all the garbage of the Clinton Foundation came out and how she made millions of dollars just from using her position of being Secretary of State and arranging meetings for her husband to speak and make millions of dollars to their own pockets. Even President Obama himself, I don't think he worked a day in his life. He was a student, he, he walked into politics directly um, and, and ladies and gentlemen, he's a billionaire, a millionaire right now. And so you, you see that uh, for the most part, Many of the Americans, the blue collar Americans, were far forgotten. Factories were closing down. People were desperate. And, 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 and the number of Americans that are depending on food stamps increased significantly. Violence in the street. And I thought to myself, this is the type of leadership and what we call shepherd that is not taking care of the sheep. And I thought to myself, I better go online and call the Americans, especially the evangelical Christians. There is a way for you to remove that unrighteous shepherd and put someone who'll take care of you. Only thing you need to do is go to vote. And bear in mind, most of the evangelical Christians around the United States were not even registered to vote. They're so apathetic, they only rely on, you know, let's pray and pray. But you know what? Sometimes God gives you a weapon beyond just prayer to go and do something, and it's called a ballot to cast. And so I urged them, I went online and I urged them, if you want to remove that type of shepherd and put a shepherd that'll take care of you, and by the way, if you listen to the inauguration speech, that's what he told people. All these crooks in Washington take care of themselves. I'm gonna take care of you. And so, in it, it's interesting, because I called for a prayer, and half a million people responded. And, and, and I was only one person. Can you imagine how many people called for prayer? How many millions were on their knees to pray? And the effective and the fervent prayer of the saints or of the righteous one availed much. And guess what? I was so much at peace that if people will go to vote, that will cause Donald Trump to be the next president of the United States of America. I went to bed the night of the election knowing that when I wake up in the morning, he'll be the president. And that's exactly what happened. So. You can clap if you want, but I can tell you that the effective and fervent prayer of the righteous one avails indeed much. And so, a week and a half ago, 72 nations gathered together in the city of Paris, and their one goal is to take the land of Israel and divide it, and to take Jerusalem and divide it, and to tell the Jewish people that the Wailing Wall is not Jewish and not Israeli-owned, and that the Jewish quarter in the old city of Jerusalem is not actually an Israeli-owned place, and basically to divide the land and to divide the city. So I went online again, and, and I did a Facebook Live, actually from the island of Boracay. The internet is pretty fast over there. And let me tell you something. Quarter million people responded. Prayer was all around the world. And as I said, when you have 208 countries that are in touch with you, it literally, globally, geographically covering the whole planet. And what happened is, people responded, and guess what? The meeting in Paris was the biggest diplomatic flop in the last 20 years. And Everything was actually uh, uh, brought down. In fact, they were so embarrassed because the document of the Paris Conference was not even adopted by the European Union itself. That's how bad it was. And so they were so embarrassed to even take it to the UN to vote in the Security Council. This is the power of the effective and fervent prayer of the saints. And you must understand, the Bible says that the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he that is restraining will do so until he will be taken out of the way. And then the man of lawlessness will show up and step in. Which means we are the restrainer. And once we, with the Holy Spirit in us, are removed from this world, then all hell will break loose. So you have a task for two things. 
A, to be on your knees and pray as a restraining power to stop evil, uh, evil uh, um, uh, things and, 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 and events from happening. And the second thing is, you are called to be watchmen, watchmen on the walls. And you know, if you read Ezekiel 33, the Bible says that if you put a watchman, the watchman's supposed to blow the trumpet when the um, danger is arriving. And then if you blow the trumpet when the danger arrives, then if somebody is not listening to you, it's his own fault if he dies. But the Bible says, if you are the watchman, but you are not blowing the trumpet, and you are not warning the people, then somebody might die because he wasn't careful, but his blood is on your hands. And I believe that as watchmen, if we know what is about to happen, we better not keep silent. See, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10, Remember the former things long past, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is no one like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. And then he says, and saying, my purpose will be established and I will accomplish all my good pleasure. God declares the end from the beginning. He wants his children to know his plans. And therefore, if you read the book, if you are in the word, you will know what's coming next. You see, walking down the streets of Manhattan, New York, I mean, apart from Starbucks, I've seen so many psychic shops. These are the little shops where you pay money, you stand in a dark room in front of an ugly woman or ugly man that tells you your future for some money, and they're often wrong. People want to know the future. People want to know what the future will bring, and they're willing to pay with their money to go into a dark room to hear an ugly man or an ugly woman telling them something that the Bible could have told them for free. And it's interesting because People don't understand that our book, the Bible, contains 29% future events. 29% of this book is Bible prophecy. God wants us to know even the future. And therefore, he says, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times things that are not yet done. And so people often think, well, I don't want to read Isaiah, Jeremiah, or Ezekiel because what if it's their own interpretation? What if it's not God? Well, you know what? The Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 20 and 21, know this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture is a matter of one's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God, which means God spoke through men like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and Ezekiel, and it was not subjected to their own interpretation. The only thing they had to do is stand and let the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, speak from God through their mouth and then later on record it in writing. That's all. So whenever you read what Isaiah says, and what Jeremiah says, and what Ezekiel says, and when Joel says, and Micah says, this is the pure word of God coming just from the mouth of a person. There is no such a thing as, I want to become a prophet. There's no such a thing as a school of prophets. There's no such a thing as, let's practice prophecy. Either God called you or not. I always say, I come from a nonprofit organization. I'm not a prophet. Never mind. But I do want you to understand that these people carried that which God had to say to the people around the world. And oftentimes I see Christians, first of all, they show up to church either with no Bible or with just the New Testament and the book of Psalms. I hope they paid half price because it's half of the Bible. There's no way the Bible cannot have the Old Testament. The Old Testament is only old because the new is new. And you turns the old into old. It doesn't mean it's outdated. It doesn't mean it's irrelevant. If it was irrelevant, Jesus would have not ever quoted it. You know that Jesus never ever taught from the New Testament? 
Jesus never ever quoted any verse from the New Testament. Neither Jesus nor Paul or Peter, none of them ever quoted the New Testament <laughs> because they were writing the New Testament. All the time when they needed to talk about the Word of God, it is say, it is said, it is written, it is always the Old Testament. Jesus himself said in Matthew 24, all that is written in the law of Moses, the Psalms, and the prophets must be fulfilled. All and must. And therefore, when we come to deal with New Testament, Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2 says the following thing regarding Jesus. The Bible says God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers in the prophets in many portions and in many ways, in these last days has spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through, through whom also he made the world. So Jesus continued that which started by the prophets. He continued. He never contradicted them. He actually said all that they wrote has to be fulfilled. And much of that actually was fulfilled also in his time. The title of the message today is the mystery of the rapture. And, and, and we, we have to understand mystery is not secret. There are two different things. Secret is something that you never heard of. It's hidden from you. You cannot see it. You cannot feel it. It's something that once being told to you, once revealed to you, that's the first time you hear about it. Mystery, on the other hand, is something you've seen before, you've heard before, but only now you truly understand what the true meaning of it is all about. The word in the Greek for mystery is musterion. That's how mystery came to the world. And it appears in the Greek New Testament 28 different times. That means that the New Testament carries an amazing uh, uh, um, uh, character of revelation of that which has already been told to us and, and, and given to us in the Old Testament. For example... The plan of God for Israel. The Bible says in the book of Romans chapter 11, Behold, I tell you mystery, blindness in part has happened to Israel. In other words, Israel cannot see the Messiah. They, some of them, if not most of them, um, you know, they have some sort of a blindness. But then the Bible tells us, but through their fall, in order to provoke the Gentiles to jealousy, salvation was given to the Gentiles. You understand? In order to provoke the Jews to jealousy, salvation was given to the Gentiles. In other words, God had a purpose even by blinding them. And the purpose, the purpose was so the gospel will go to the whole world. Trust me, if the Jews would have accepted Christ 2,000 years ago, I know my people, we would have never shared it with you. <laughs> but, you know, they hardened their hearts. God blinded them because they hardened their hearts, and therefore the gospel was given to the whole world. Isn't that amazing? It's a mystery. We will never be able to understand it. But God is an amazing God, and God, with Him there is no partiality. He loves you just as He loves every Jewish person around the world. By the way, He loves the Muslims, and He loves the Hindus, and by that, He wants everybody to believe in Jesus. There is no way, and there is no truth, and there is no uh, uh, um, life in anyone else. There is only one name under heaven by which men can be saved, and this is Yeshua, Jesus. And therefore, the plan for Israel eventually, the Bible says, that eventually all Israel will be saved. Amazing. We can hardly understand that. But this is a mystery. Another mystery, the mystery of the true Messiah. The Jewish people, in their mindset, were thinking that Messiah is not God in the flesh. He's just a good guy, maybe a charismatic person, riding a horse, bringing peace and prosperity, and reigning from Jerusalem over all the world. That's what they're expecting. But the true Messiah is someone that according to Zechariah 9.9 had to come riding a donkey. It's according to Isaiah had to be born to a virgin. It's according to Micah 5 had to be born in Bethlehem. It's according to Isaiah had to be um, the uh, uh, king, uh, you know, the um, wonderful counselor. 
everlasting Father and um, Almighty God. So it has to be a son born to a virgin. He has to be born in Bethlehem, yet he is God in the flesh. And the ultimate sacrifice, excuse me, sacrifice of that man is that he will give himself as a sacrifice on our behalf. If you read Isaiah 53. So only when Jesus came to the world, that mystery was revealed. Another mystery that people often mistakenly uh, uh, take uh, as something else is the mystery of the church and Christ. The Bible says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church. And I know a lot of husbands are like, really? That much? Yes. You know, in the Old Testament, husband and a husband and, 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 and his wife was always Israel was likened to be the, the wife and God was likened to be the husband and he loved how they walked after him in the desert in the land unsown and he says the days I remember that days of our betrothal they they were amazingly almost like sort of like engaged and then you see when the gospel came to the whole world and all of you here have been grafted into Israel, now you are the bride. And in, in interesting, Jesus is the bridegroom. So now the mystery is solved. The church and Christ are the uh, uh, bride and the bridegroom. Amen? Amen. So, we continue on another mystery, the mystery of the soon rapture. That's what we're going to talk about. The Bible says, behold, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us will fall asleep, but all of us will change. Let's find out what it means to fall asleep and let's find out what it means to be changed. Another mystery, the mystery of the Gentile heirs. You know, the Jews never understood what it meant in the book of Isaiah, I will call those that are not my people, my people. <laughs> But then, of course, we know you guys who once were with no hope, without God, who once were of believing in other gods, you were goyim, you were Gentiles, and Gentiles in the ancient times were pagans. All of them were pagans. Now you come to the knowledge of the true Messiah, you come to the knowledge of the King of Israel, you come to the knowledge of the God of Israel, and guys, you are now sons and daughters. You can call him Abba Father, and you are the heirs of his kingdom. Amen. And last but not least, the mystery of lawlessness. Lawlessness is when there is a law and you don't want to obey that law. The first law, the first rule, the first request God ever had from Adam was, you see that tree, you see that fruit, just don't touch it. That's it. Very simple. And guess what happened? The only thing God ever asked not to do was immediately done. Sin entered the world and sin brought darkness to the world and all of that is because of disobedience. This is why God says obedience is better than sacrifice. I don't need your, your prayers, I don't need your money, I don't need your sacrifices, I need your obedience. It starts there. And so the mystery of lawlessness is the mystery of the one who started lawlessness, of Satan himself, and his spirit is all over this world, and eventually he will want to take over the world. Mystery started in Genesis. We only understand it in light of our rapture when we are gone. So let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 and 52. The Bible says, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Remember, mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. Believers don't just die. We just fall asleep, the Bible says. You know, if you have a son or a daughter and they fall asleep in the living room, you just graciously pick them up and bring them to the bedroom. This is what happens when you as a believer die in this world. God takes you gently from this bed all the way to your heavenly house to sleep in where you belong to. That's it. We don't really die forever. We are just temporarily asleep. And it's interesting because he says, first of all, we shall not all sleep, basically implying that some of us will never die. In other words, when Jesus comes to take his bride, some of us will still be alive. And then he says, maybe all of, not, all of us are not going to be sleeping, but all of us are going to be changed. How? 
change how? First of all, in what process? The Bible says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye. Now look at my eye. I'm blinking, twinkling of an eye. It's very fast, isn't it? Why don't we do this? To, to count of three, I want you all to clap. A very quick clap. One, two, three. Uh, let's try it again. One, two, three. That's how fast. And this is actually slow. First service was faster. <laughs> That's how we're going to change. And, and it's interesting because it says at the last trumpet, and then he says, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible. This is exactly how we're going to change. You're not going to become uh, supermodels overnight. That's not what it's all about. Your body will be incorruptible, which means all of our body cells that are dying every day will not die anymore. And the laws of nature will not apply to us anymore. Gravity will not hold us down here anymore. We, the Bible says, the dead will first raise incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Wow. Amazing. You know, we'll be talking to someone, bang, we're gone. Because the law of gravity is not there, because I'm not, you know, corruptible anymore. I'm gone. You know, we don't belong to this world. Our citizenship is in heaven. And we're going to where we belong. And we're going to, it's going to, it's not going to be a Mary Poppins uh, 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 experience of, of everybody's going to look at us going all the way up. No. The Bible says, in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, and all the idea of last trumpet and the trumpet will sound, it's not here. It's in heaven. It's in heaven. We're going to see that when we deal with 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And by the way, what is the rapture? What is rapture? The word rapture is not even in the Bible. Therefore, so many churches either don't teach about the rapture or they have a completely misunderstood idea of what the rapture is all about. Because the word rapture truly is not in the Bible. But what can I say? The Bible was never written in the English language to begin with. The original language was not English. The original language of the New Testament was, for the most part, Greek. And in, with all the respect, don't look for the English word. Look for the Greek word. And the Greek word is harpazo. Say that. Harpazo. And then they translated it to the Latin, and it became rapturo in the Latin. And that's how rapture comes to the world. So the word rapture is actually taken from the Latin that was taken from the Greek, but in the Greek it's harpazo. And by the way, it is in the Bible. It is in the Bible in 1 Thessalonians 4.17. But it's not only there. I found harpazo in other places as well. To be snatched or to be taken away is not only from earth to heaven. It can be from here all the way to Ayala Avenue right now. Bypassing Edsa, not standing in traffic. Hallelujah. Isn't that a miracle by itself? And so I want you to understand, for example, Acts chapter 8, verse 39, that word, harpazo, appears right there. <laughs> Remember how Philip the evangelist was in that cart together with the Ethiopian eunuch, and he was telling him about the Messiah. And by the way, he did not quote John 3.16. He did not quote anything from the Gospel of John at all. He actually had only one book. In those days, nobody owned a Bible. The Bible as a book is something that almost every one of you, I hope, has at least one copy in your Bible. And I really hope it is with you today. But I'm trying to say that only multi-billionaires could have afforded the whole Bible because those books were all in scrolls. It wasn't a book at that time. And you have to understand that very seldom someone will own that or will have all the books. Now, Philip is on that carriage, and he's with the Ethiopian eunuch, and he actually only used one book. What book was it? The book of Isaiah. 
The Bible says he read from the book of Isaiah, led the Ethiopian to the Lord, and the Ethiopian says, so what stops me from being baptized? So nothing. They stopped. They went down to the pool. He baptized him. And guess what happened? The Bible says, now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. Harpazo. Rapturo. Rapture. Not this way, this way. Philip was gone. The Ethiopian is two minutes old believer. He just got baptized 40 seconds ago, and he's already experiencing a rapture. Now, it's interesting. You would think that this is too weird. He probably would turn around and run away because this is wrong. He doesn't believe in such a thing. Guys, sometimes believers that just accept Christ 20 seconds ago can have more faith than, uh, than people that have you know, been walking with the Lord for 20, 30 years. This guy, instead of running away because this is too weird, because the guy just disappeared in front of his eyes. He was gone. This guy, the Bible says, he went on his way, what? Rejoicing. Wow. When you have the Spirit of God in you, and when you innocently, like a child, believe, then you rejoice. Guess what? Peter, three years walked after Jesus, comes to the tomb. The tomb is empty. Do you think he was rejoicing? No. Oh, he was looking and looking, and he, and he went back home, wondering what just had happened, the Bible says, scratching his head. No joy, no happiness, nothing. How sad that you can follow Jesus for years, and really not hear what he says and believe when it happens. Another incident, incident of, of a rapture in 2 Corinthians 12, 2-4. Paul is writing to the Corinthians in Greece, and he says, I know a man in Christ who 14 years ago, whether in body I do not know, whether out of the body I do not know, God knows, such a one was caught up to the third heaven, rapture. Turo, harpazo in the Greek. That's the word. You see, Paul describes another rapture of someone who was just up there to see something in what we call um, the, uh, into paradise. He was caught up into paradise. He heard inexpressible words, which is not even lawful for a man to utter. He was raptured for a reason and for a season. So we should not really be so perplexed about this idea. It happened before. But let's go now to 1 Thessalonians 4 and see. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with a voice of the archangel, and with the trumpet of God. Bear in mind, the rapture will take place when the world down here will not be ready. <laughs> the Bible says people will be like just in the day of Noah. I mean, marrying and drinking. It's not going to be, let's have a rapture service, stand in CCF Center, and get raptured. No. The Bible says that the trumpets, that the sounds, that the amazing excitement will actually be in the heavenlies, not down here. The angels will get ready. They will blow the trumpets. God himself, the trumpet of God, will be sounded. And then what happened, just as Paul wrote to the Corinthians, the dead in Christ will rise first, and then the Bible says, then we, say we, we, us, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the cloud to meet the Lord. Where? In the air. Isn't that interesting? The law of gravity is gone. We will be taken. And we will probably for the first time in our life will see all the believers in the world. First time. Can you imagine? You're like coming to heaven and... A, Oh, hi. And then you tell, I did not know. Oh, look at him. Praise the Lord. And where is our pastor? <laughs> you never know. Somebody once told me, when we get to heaven, we'll be surprised who we see and who we don't see. But I, I just want you to understand, the first time ever all believers on planet Earth will meet is in the clouds. Isn't that amazing? Hmm. And, and, and then it's in the air. 
It's not on the ground. Get used to it. You'll be caught up. Harpazo, rapturo, raptured. And the, the most beautiful thing is this. We'll be caught up in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Oh, yeah, all right. You know, Jesus promised he's going to come and get us. He says, I'm leaving you, but I'm not going to leave you as orphans. I'm going to send you the Holy Spirit, comfort you, lead you, guide you, but I'm coming back. I'm coming back. It's so beautiful. By the way, we will not be the first ones to be taken. Guess what? In the Old Testament... We had someone in the book of Genesis, chapter 5, verse 24, named Enoch, who was the first one to be taken without having to die. And then Elijah the prophet, he's not just taken, he's a, he's a drama queen. He wants to have a whole carriage full of horses to take him. That's the way for him to go to heaven. And then, of course, we have Jesus in Acts chapter 1, verse 9, taken to heaven. But what's the difference between the first two and Jesus? These two never died. Jesus had to die. He came to the world to offer himself. He died, resurrected, and then he ascended to heaven, beginning, basically, the first resurrection. Anyone who has been resurrected before died right after, just like Lazarus. Lazarus was resurrected for a reason and a season, but he died after. He could have not been alive forever because the Bible says that Jesus is the first fruit from among those who fell asleep. He's the first one to ever be resurrected and live forever. So we already see those three. By the way, why do we have to be raptured? Why can't Jesus come back and, and, and establish his kingdom on earth? Well, there is a reason. First of all, Jesus promised that he's coming to take us. You understand? And with him, a promise is a promise. In John 14, verse 3, Jesus says the following thing. If I go and prepare a place for you, which means he's working now, preparing a place for us, then I will come again and receive you to myself. The Greek word receive implies that we will come to him and he will receive us. Receive you to myself. And then he says that where I am, there you may be also. Which means, who is changing the address here? We do. Because where is Jesus today? Jesus today, right now, is at the right hand of the Father. He's in heaven. Where are we today? Tiendecitas, you call it? Ortiga Center, you call it? Manila, you call it? We are on earth. He's in heaven. And the Bible says, where I am, you will also be. So we are those who need to change address. And he's going to come and take us. You have to understand. It's very simple. He promised to come and take us. And he promised that he is going to prepare a place for us. And then he will come and take us. What's the point of Jesus working so hard in heaven to prepare a place for us, and then we'll never be there? Now, how many of you know that there is a spiritual war in this world? How many of you know that? You know, it's a war that we really cannot see, we can feel. It's a war that has two battlefields. Ephesians 6, 12 says, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, and against powers, and against the rulers of the darkness of his age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness. In where? It's not here. It's in the heavenly places. There's a great war going on right now as we speak in the heavenlies. Did you know that? An amazing war. It reflects on us, but it's still in heaven. The Bible says it's a war that we may cannot see, but there are two battlefields for that war. The battlefield of heaven where it is right now, and heaven is a place dominated by God and by God's choice, Jesus. This is my son in whom I am pleased. He is the choice of God. He is the one who is going to be the king of kings and the Lord of lords. He is the one through him the whole thing was created. And therefore, heaven is a for sure place Satan is about to lose. And in, in, in um, the other battlefield is going to be earth. And earth is different. This world is dominated by Satan and men's choice. We men 
unless you are born again and spirit filled, we always choose the wrong thing. Our choices are directed by our sinly, sinful nature. Did you know that when, when, when Pontius Pilate presented Jesus to the crowd, he told them, this is Jesus, but if you want, I will release this guy. Now, what's the name of the other guy was? Barabbas. By the way, his name was not Barabbas. We added the S to make it sound bad, just like Judah became Judas Iscariot. But his real name was Judah. This guy's real name was Barabba. But did you know that in the Gospels it says that Barabbas' first name was Jesus? Did you know that? Jesus was a common name in Hebrew. It means Yeshua. It means salvation. We find it in the book of Ezra, in the book of Nehemiah. It was a common name. So there is a guy called Jesus Barabba, and there's a guy called Jesus <laughs> and, and then of Nazareth, but Jesus, the son of the father, and Jesus, what, you know what Barabba means? Barabba means the son of the father. Abba is father, Bar is the son of, like Bar Mitzvah, son of the commandment. So here you go, Jesus, the son of the father, and Jesus, son of a father, who do you want me to release? And guess what the people wanted? The wrong guy. Why? Because this guy we feel good with. <laughs> this guy will not tell us that we need to repent, that we need to change, that we need to uh, 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 turn around. He will not expose our hypocrisy, our religiosity. We can continue with our vices. This is why so many mega churches around the world are actually, in reality, they don't preach the Jesus of Nazareth. They preach the, the other Jesus, son of the Father. They preach someone who, with whom or through whom you don't have to repent. You don't have to turn around. You don't have to walk in godly ways. Did you know there's even a new, uh, a new uh, I will call it theology, I'm not even sure it's a theology, that crawls into Manila right now speaking of the fact that you don't even have to be saved because all men are saved already. There is no hell. There is no, no rapture. All men are saved. Adolf Hitler is saved. He's in heaven. ISIS terrorists are in heaven. Everybody is going to heaven. Terrible, isn't it? But think about it. This is what people want to hear. If you are dead in your sins, you want to have someone who tells you that you're saved. And you will actually go there rather to go to a place that uh, tells you that you need to change. So heaven is dominated by God. The world is dominated by Satan. And it's interesting because that which is in heaven will eventually move to the world. You go to uh, the book of Revelation chapter 12. You hear of a war in the heavenlies. And how eventually Satan will be thrown down because he lost in heaven. He will be thrown down to earth. And from chapter 12 to chapter 19, Satan on earth in the shape of the Antichrist will create horrific things, especially to the Jewish people. But even in chapter 19, eventually, he will lose even on earth. When Jesus comes back, he will throw Satan down to the bottomless pit for a thousand years. Ever since I was a little boy, my dream was to be an ambassador I really, truly prepared myself to one day become an ambassador of Israel, to travel around the world and to represent my country and the right of Israel to exist all over the world. Little did I know that God at the age of 17 will save me, save me from death. Because at some point in my life, growing up without parents, with no hope, I wanted to kill myself. I carefully planned my suicide. I had a whole bottle full of pills that I was about to take when I was 17, thinking there is no hope for me in this world. I was desperately in love with a girl that didn't even know that I exist. Look at me. Don't I exist? I wanted to kill myself. And I want to tell you something. God saw this. And the last minute, I stopped before I did that very unwise step. And then the next morning I realized my best friend at school is actually a Jewish believer in Jesus. And he invited me to, to study for the final exams of high school in his house. And I went to his house and, and I, we sit to, to have lunch and, and everybody suddenly hold hands and close their eyes and they start praying and talking to God like he's their best friend. And I'm, as a, as a Jew, I was looking all around to see where's the prayer book. No prayer book. They talk to God. And they talk to him as if he's right there. I said, wow. Well, I lost my appetite right now. 
And it's interesting because I started asking questions and I didn't know a thing about it. Something sounded right, but I still did not understand. Why do you have to, every prayer you, you, you do in the name of Jesus, in the name of Yeshem Yeshua, why? And a lady told me, why don't you ask God? Pray and ask God. And this is a, a, a very interesting answer. Me? Pray? God? He, will He hear me? Oh, yeah. So I didn't even know how to pray. So I, I wrote something on a piece of prayer and put it on the wall. I knelt down and I read from it. And I said, God, if you exist, uh, just show me who Jesus is. That's it. And I went to bed. The next morning I woke up. Bear in mind, I've been working since I'm 12 years old. I go to work before school and I go to work after school. So I go to work before school and I put together all the little pieces of newspaper. And I put them together and I open the newspaper and I see the word Yeshua, Jesus, big, bold, capital letters in the Hebrew newspaper. I close the newspaper. I thought I'm losing it. I thought I'm hallucinating. And then slowly, slowly, I open it again. And it was still there. Apparently, it was a Campus Crusade for Christ, Jesus film, showing in Jerusalem only for two nights in, on that very week. And it's in Hebrew. Can you imagine how God loves me? A whole production for me in the Hebrew language. The movie was actually filmed in Israel. So I see places I know, I hear the language I know, I see the prophecies from the Old Testament that I know, and at the very end, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. I go back home and I tell everyone, you're all sinners. <laughs> my foster family kicked me out of the house. After 10 years of living with that family, and I lived with certain families, I never lived with my parents. And then, you see, I had a dream to be a diplomat. I was a no one. I wanted to kill myself. And I wanted to be someone that everybody will know. And it's funny because being an ambassador, I thought I'll travel the world. Little did I know that God is going to radically save my life. And today, in the year 2017, I'm going to be traveling in 14 different countries to speak, not politics, but the Word of God. But what I learn is that, let me tell you what I learned. I learn that in the diplomacy etiquette, we know that whenever a nation is about to declare war on another nation, the first thing they do is call back their ambassador. Am I right? That's what we do. We don't want our ambassador in the other country to be killed when we wage war on that country. So we call back the ambassador. Isn't that interesting? That in Revelation 19, when God is, we know in Revelation 12, when, when Satan is thrown down, God is now going to wage war on earth because of the satanic practices of not only Satan himself, but all the people on earth. And just before he's going to fight the world, guess what God is about to do? God is about to call his ambassadors home before declaring war on this world. Amen? Now, I want to tell you something. Oh, I don't think I want to be an ambassador. Well, let me tell you something. Nobody asks you. Because guess what? 2 Corinthians 5.20 says, Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ, as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. You're all ambassadors, whether you like it or not. And your job in this world is to what? Is to plead. Through, Jesus will plead through us, and we implore, we are being implored on, on Christ's behalf to reconcile to God. We need to tell people to reconcile to God. We are the watchmen on the wall. We know what's going to come up to the world. We need to warn the world. We need to preach the gospel. We need people to get saved. Not all are saved. People can only be saved through Jesus. He is the way. He is the truth. He is the life. No one can come to the Father but through Him. And guess what? If you think you're all going to be raptured, you're wrong. Uh-oh. We were just happy two seconds ago. You just spoiled the party. Now let me tell you something. Recent researchers showed that more than half of church attenders are not believers. 
They don't have a personal relationship with the Lord. They walk out of church, back to their world, do whatever they want. Then they come to church, they give the money, they say hallelujah, and we're okay. You think God is that old just to see you on Sunday and not to see what you do on Monday and Tuesday? And you think that you're fooling God? You're fooling yourself. Because I tell you what, when David sinned, he lost the joy of his salvation. He was a miserable man. And when he was exposed by Nathan the prophet in Psalm 51, he says, restore for me the joy of my salvation. You are the most miserable person in this room, in this auditorium, if you are acting Christian. Because on one hand, you're a Christian. On the other hand, you know you're not. And then you always have that struggle. I want to tell you something. There was only one criteria. There's only one stipulation for being raptured. In John 11, verses 25 and 26, Jesus talked about the rapture in a very beautiful way. He talked to Martha, and he said to Martha, Martha, I am the resurrection and the life, he said. I, Jesus, I am the resurrection and the life. Look what he says. He who believes in me, this is the stipulation, he who believes in me. You have to believe in Jesus. Believing means that you have to abide in him. You have to follow him. You have to obey him. And then he says, he who believes in me will live even if he dies, implying that those dead will live again. And then he says, and, who and everyone who lives and believes in me will never die. In other words, he says, those who died will live again, and those who are still alive will not die. Just what Paul said. And then he says, the most important question in the entire Bible. Do you believe this? Isn't that interesting? The rapture will take place. The Antichrist is going to come to the world. There will be chaos. There will be great tribulation. The only, that's a fact. It's a given. The question is, do you believe this? Matthew 24, 40 and 41 says, Then there will be two men in the field. One will be taken and one will be left. Two women will be grinding in the meal. One will be taken and one will be left. The rapture is not going to happen in a church service. People will live their life and it will come when you don't know. Therefore, you have to be ready. One will, I mean, you will be in the world. You'll be working in your working place. You'll be driving. Can you imagine if, if an airplane is flown by two believers? They're gone. I, 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 I'm interested what, what the flight attendant has to say to the passengers. Can anyone fly a plane? <laughs> and, and, and I want you to understand, people ask me, so when is the rapture? By the way, I could be a billionaire if I knew. <laughs> but when is the rapture? I can tell you when it's not. It's not on September 23rd, 2017. Why? Because all over the internet, they're saying, this is the date. And I'm asking them, why? And they said, oh, you don't know? Oh, it's the Feast of Trumpets. And therefore, the Bible says the last trumpet, it has to happen on the Feast of Trumpets. Oh, really? Oh, yes. And there's another reason. The constellation of the stars on that day will look like a woman with the moon at his foot and her foot and all of that. I said, really? Wow, you are very clever, you know? You are so clever that you know things that even Jesus don't know. Why? Because the Bible says in the book of Matthew 24, 35 to 39, but of the day and the hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, nor the Son, but the Father alone. So if you know it's September 23rd, 2017, wow, I'm very impressed. And the Bible says, for the coming of the Son of Man will be just like in the days of Noah. For as these, in those days before the flood, they were eating and drinking and marrying and giving marriage. They will go to the nightclub. They will go to the bar. Just doing everything. <laughs> Living ungodly life. And the only person who stayed away from all of that and actually made sure he is ready 
is Noah preparing the ark. Now Noah didn't know the day, he didn't know the hour, but he, need, he knew one thing, judgment is coming and I must get ready. And he prepared the ark. So you have two options. Go to, how do you call those clubs? Valkyrie or uh, clubs, uh, palaces, I don't know. All these names, you can go, go ahead, live your life, do whatever you want, get drunk. And just one day when it happens, you'll be sitting there and drinking while your friends are gone. It says that they did not understand until the flood came and took them all away. So will the coming of the Son of Man be. Non-believers will not understand you. But then when the flood comes, it took them all away. Interesting, isn't it? The Bible says in Matthew 24, 42 to 44, Therefore be on the alert, for you do not know which day your Lord is coming. But be sure of this, that if it's the head of the house had known at what time of the night the thief was coming, he would have been on the alert and would have, uh, have allowed and would have not and would not have allowed his house to be broken into. For this reason, you also must be ready. For the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you, the believers, do not think he will. In other words, Jesus is not giving us the day or the hour, but we understand the times and the seasons. I want to tell you something, guys. Europe, if you ever follow me on YouTube, Behold Israel, you'll be able to see a message that I gave about how Europe is getting ready for the rise of the Antichrist. The European Parliament in Strasbourg is built as the Tower of Babel. Outside of the European community um, um, government, you have a statue of a woman rides a beast, just like in Revelation. You see, in Europe, there is a, 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 a whole um, nuclear facility that is trying to imitate the Big Bang. They, they actually want to prove there is no God. Outside of the laboratories, besides the collider that is under the ground, outside of the laboratories, there is a statue of Shiva, the goddess of destruction. Their headquarters in a place called Apollyon, which is the head of the underworld. These people are so engaged into importing Babylon to Europe. Adolf Hitler designed the whole area of marching of the Nazi party after the, 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 the seat of Satan that was in the city of Pergamon. In Berlin, they built a museum called the Pergamon Museum. They imported the seat of Satan into Europe. They imported the entrance to Babylon, the Ishtar Gate, into Berlin. You have to understand, guys, Europe is consumed with the effort to bring about the Antichrist to rise from that territory. And if that's not enough, for him to rise, there has to be first a war in the Middle East. The Bible says in Ezekiel 38 that Russia and Turkey and Iran are going to gather to invade Israel. Guess what? Because they use ISIS as an excuse, Russia and Turkey and Iran are already on the borders with Israel as of last year because they are getting ready to that which they don't even know yet. It's beautiful. What's so beautiful about a war? It's beautiful that they don't even know, but God knows the hearts of the future decisions of the leaders. When God called Moses to go to speak to Pharaoh, God already told Moses, Pharaoh will not like it. Before Moses even went, God knew the answer of Pharaoh. God knows what the leaders will think before they even think. And he's laughing at them. So I'm telling you, the world is ready. When I was in Boracay last week, there was the strongest earthquake in the world for 2017, 7.3 in the depth of the Pacific Ocean off the coast of the Visayas. You know that ever since 2017 started, more earthquakes started and took place, including several in Italy that actually completely buried a whole hotel in, in a ski resort. We have never seen that many earthquakes in our life, in the history. Ever since they started recording earthquakes, we have never seen that many. The world is ready. 
And regarding the time of the tribulation, there are the three options before the tribulation, the, the, the time of the rapture. Before the tribulation, in the middle of the tribulation, and after the tribulation. In other words, rare, medium well, or well done. How do you want to get to heaven? I don't understand. Why do you want to be medium well? Why do you want to be well done? Why do you want to get to heaven completely burned, completely, you know, beaten up? Why do you think God wants you to suffer? The Bible says that we are not destined to the wrath of God. In fact, the Bible says in Revelation 3.10, I will keep you from or out of the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world. And in 1 Thessalonians 1.10, He will deliver us from the wrath to come. We are not to go through the tribulation. If we go through the tribulation, how can we encourage one another? <laughs> hey, it's going to be fun. Our heads are going to roll down the aisle. Are you crazy? Now, if you want to stay, stay. Don't cause me to stay. So the order of the rapture is Jesus Christ himself descends from heaven. And then he comes to receive us unto himself. He comes in a twinkling of an eye with a shout of a trumpet of call of God. He resurrects those who believe and, uh, and who have fallen asleep in death. And then those who are alive at the time will be caught up, raptured in the air. And what is it that people mostly mistaken? They always, always mix the rapture with the second coming of Christ. I will teach you an easy way to differentiate between the two. The rapture is Christ coming to the church and we meet in the air. And the second coming is Christ coming with the church and we land on the ground. These are the two major things. You understand that? And you have to understand that the rapture and the second coming are not the same thing. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 13. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men, teaching us, the grace of God, Jesus, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age. And if you are a true believer, and if you are not after the worldly lusts, and if you live soberly, godly, and righteously, then you are actually looking for the blessed hope, which is our gathering to be with the Lord. Not just the blessed hope, but when we come back with Him, it will be the glorious appearing of our great Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You see, in this world, there are two births, there are two deaths, and there are two resurrections. You can be born of, of your mother, all of us, and then you can be born again. Then you can die, it is appointed upon men once to die. We all die. Or you can be dead forever in the second death. You can resurrect in the first resurrection that started with Jesus, continues with the rapture, and ends up with the resurrection of the saints of the tribulation at the end of the tribulation. Or you can actually resurrect just for the sake of the trial where you're going to be sent forever to die. So you need to always try or always be having the second birth so you will be in the first resurrection, so we will not have the second death. You understand that? And I want to finish the message right now with the following thing. The rapture is the promise of Christ to us. The rapture is the blessed hope of the believer. The rapture is our rescue from the evil one. The rapture is the gathering of the saints. And it could be the last chance for the Gentiles to believe in Jesus. When I prayed and asked God, what is the message you want me to carry to the whole world? I'm going to be everywhere in Indonesia, in Japan, in Australia, in Singapore, in, in, in Mexico, America, Canada, Norway, Sweden, Germany, Netherlands. Uh, I, I mean, name it. And, and what is the message for the whole world? And, and he said, go to the book of Revelation, chapter 22, verse 17. The spirit and the bride say, come. It's important you understand. God wants us to want him to come. You know, the Bible says that we should tell him, come. He who testifies, Revelation 22, 20, to these things say, yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. The Bible says what we should be very active, not passive. Matthew 7, 7 says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and, it will be, and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. We should ask him to come. And you know what? The problem is more, many of us don't ask him to come because we know we're not ready. 
I was in a car of a, of, of, of a Singaporean pastor. And he told me, Amir, I make so much money in my business. Oh, thank you, Lord. I'm building a big house right now. It's going to be ready next year. Actually, I wish Jesus will not come back yet. I want to see the house finish, and I want to live in it and enjoy it. And I looked at him, and I said, the bride is not ready. If he thinks that enjoying the earthly wealth is even equal to that which Jesus prepared, are you crazy? Jesus is coming to take us all the way to heaven, to a place that He prepared. It's not going to be few workers. It's going to be Him. Streets of gold. Mansions, the Bible says. And you want to be stuck in Edsa? And the last thing I want you to understand, I don't want you to miss your visitation. See, when Jesus came to Jerusalem, He stopped the donkey and he wept. Jesus, God, looked at Jerusalem and wept. Why do you think Jesus wept? Let me tell you why. He saw a city that missed his visitation. They just didn't see the need for him to save them. They thought he needs to rule the world, but they didn't want him to rule their hearts. They missed his visitation. Visitation, by the way, somebody comes and leaves. If you have a house, and you have a visitor, and he comes, and he's not leaving. He's not a visitor. He's a leech. He's an invader. A visitor is someone who comes and leaves. That's why when you come to a country, sometimes they want to see your ticket back to make sure you're not a leech, you're a visitor. I want to tell you something. The same way Jesus visited the world and then left, that's a visitation. We are going to visit heaven and then come back. Our time in heaven is limited to seven years because then we come back with him to reign here for a thousand years. Don't miss your visitation. So as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed down, I'm asking you all at this time, because I have a very strong feeling that this afternoon, many of you here are not ready. And as our eyes are closed and our heads are bowed down, everybody, if it's you, you're not ready. While everybody's eyes are closed and heads are bowed, if I can see your hand, so I can pray for I see your hand. Yes, I see your hand. I see your hands here. I see your hands in the back. I see your hands here. I see your hands. I see your hands up here in the middle. I see your hands up above. Can I see your hands? Wow, so many hands. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that you stir the hearts of your children today to understand their need to be ready for your coming to take us. We thank you that you don't want your children to be lost, that even if some count you as slacking for not coming back on time, it's not slackness. You do not want any to perish, but all to repent and to come to the saving knowledge of Jesus. So, Father, visit those people who just raised their hands, and may they acknowledge their sin, may they repent, may they turn around, may they start living life of denying ungodliness and worldly lust, may they live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking forward and expecting their blessed hope, their gathering to be with the Lord. Father, I thank you that you want your children not to be scared, but to be prepared. And thank you for, for, for Bible prophecy. Thank you for your word that you have exalted above your name. Father, I thank you for everyone here today. And I would like to bless you all if you stand up with the Aaronic blessing that Moses actually told Aaron to bless the children of Israel in Numbers chapter 6. Everybody stand up. And I would like to extend that blessing to you in the Hebrew language and then in the English. So please close your eyes and, ex and just open your arms to receive that blessing. Yevarechecha Adonai v'yishmerecha. Ya'er Adonai panavelecha v'yichunecha. 
יישא אדוני פניו אליך וישם לך שלום. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord shine towards you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you shalom, peace. That peace that surpasses all understanding, it's a peace that the world cannot give you. It's a peace that only the Prince of Peace can give you. And it is in the name of the Prince of Peace and the Lord of Lords, the Lion of Judah, the Lamb of God, the Holy One of Israel, the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. It's in the name that is above all names and the only name under heaven by which men can be saved. It is in the name of Yeshua, Jesus, we pray, and all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.